we take the sheer power and seemingly endless possibilities that we have at our disposal for granted. Our world is changing. The new generation of today is growing up in a way that is completely different from anything that we've experienced in the past. We ourselves forget that we once grew up with technology. Although primitive, it was all around us. This is especially true if you're a kid of the 1980s or 1990s. Today we're all connected and the entire world is at our fingertips. We can reach out to whoever we want, whenever we want. It's all changing very fast, isn't it? But where did it come from and where is it going? Right now, we're at the very start of an overhaul of our modern world. The subsequent events that you're about to learn all come together to form one of the greatest stories ever told. Let me take you on a journey to a time when things were simpler. The very start of our story has humble beginnings, but it's absolutely incredible when you think about it. It's amazing how many people don't actually know how it all began. Here we go. For most of humanity, a computer was actually a person that carried out complex calculations pretty much all day. One of these computers was Charles Babbage. In the early 1820s, Babbage was getting pretty annoyed because he kept finding mistakes in his log tables. There were cases of ships screwing up and running aground because there were mistakes in the navigation tables. There needed to be a solution, and he was the first to ask, well, if physical machines can do physical work, why can't physical machines do mental work? And not just any mental work, but a general purpose kind of mental work. And with that simple thought, the idea of the computer as we know it was born. Fast forwarding a bit through time, we found ourselves in the 1930s. Wasn't it all a rosy time by any standards? We had the Great Depression, the rise of Hitler, the Hindenburg disaster. It wasn't all bad though. It's said that during the toughest times, we sometimes come up with the greatest inventions. This next piece of the story is the stuff of legend. Enter the German gentleman, Konrad Zuss. You could loosely say that he is the inventor of the computer. While slaving away, doing some engineering calculations, Zeus had a vision. What if he could get a machine to do the work for him? An automatic computer. Zeus believed in his idea of the computer so much that he quit his job and moved back into his parents' place just to build it. He saw that human computers just used 10 numbers and a few symbols. When you moved them around, you got the result that you wanted. How do you simplify that? The answer? Binary. Just ones and zeros. It can't get any simpler. This thinking was so brilliant that we still use his solution today. To utilize the form of ones and zeros, he decided to use mechanical switches. But there was a problem. Every switch had to be perfect or else the whole thing wouldn't work. There needed to be a better way. The answer came in the form of magnetic telephone switches. Once he had completed his work, he decided to test it. He fed in a complex problem, and it worked. And this was the very beginning. Well, why did he do it? Who better to explain it than himself? This is an interview with him in 1992. Well, a young person clearly has better things to do than study and calculate. You could say that I was too lazy to calculate, and so I invented the computer. What an awesome guy. The pioneer of our modern world invented the computer because he was lazy. Let's continue on. Travelling a little bit further, the story continues in the middle of the war in the 1940s. Even though Konrad Zuse's computer was the stuff of genius, the use of relay switches made it too slow to really be of any use. That's why people in the 40s looked to vacuum tubes as the way of the future. During the heat of World War II, the US military had human computers calculate the angle at which missiles should be fired for different weather conditions. It took 63,000 hours of human brain power just to complete one firing table for one weather condition. As you could guess, 
there weren't enough people for the job. There must have been a better way. But what could it be? Two guys, John Markley and Jay Eckard, had the solution. ENIAC. A computer composed of 18,000 vacuum tubes. The crazy part? Vacuum tubes were notorious for blowing up, so the scoffing experts calculated that the machine would break down every five seconds. But the army was so desperate that they went ahead with funding anyway. And it worked. They pulled it off. We'll skip the details, but basically they utilised a very clever design that would ensure that the machine kept working if one of the parts happened to fail. Here's a fun fact. Since ENIAC couldn't actually store anything, in order to change a program, you had to rewire the entire system with a team of people. This usually took days. Well, how do we go about changing a program today? Easy. Just double click or tap. ENIAC was groundbreaking because it was the first ever electric general purpose computer. Even though the electric computer was a brilliant idea, there was a large amount of social acceptance lag. People take years to get used to or comfortable with new ideas. Nobody knew what to use the computer for, so not many people took notice at all. It was said that the entire USA would only ever need eight computers. Ever. Let's take a look at the moment when this all changed. 1951. This is when the computer went public. Univac, the first commercial computer, was asked to predict the outcome of the US presidential election. Guy speaking to you from CBS Television Election Headquarters here in New York City. Let's turn to that miracle of the modern age, the electronic brain Univac and uh, Charles Collingwood. This is not a joke or a trick. It's an experiment. We think it's going to work. We don't know. We hope it'll work. What resulted was absolute chaos. Univac predicted that there would be a landslide victory for Eisenhower. But there was so much acceptance lag that nobody believed the results. How could something predict the outcome with only 5% of the votes? It turns out that Univac was right to within 3%. That must have scared the hell out of people because people began to get scared of the electronic brains. He's trying to replace us all with a mechanical brain. That means the end of us all. Peg. That clip may look hilarious now, but back then it was a legit concern. People were actually being replaced by computers. But they were still huge though, and the culprit? That dodgy vacuum tube. But it was soon going to be replaced by something that was a 50th of the size, was a hundred times lighter, and still used a fraction of the power. It was called the transistor, one of the greatest inventions of the 20th century. Let's step things up a little bit. We'll take a stroll through time into the 1960s. The story really begins to gain momentum now. All that stuff before was just child's play. Strap yourselves in for a few surprises. The 1960s were a time of change. Some notable characters later on in the story got their inspiration from the spirit of the 60s. The 60s were a jumble of the counterculture, Vietnam War, moon landing, some revolutionary music, and many events which would change the course of history forever. Finally, people were free. Computers no longer had to be the size of rooms, so they could be more powerful and do much more stuff, and also be smaller. Unfortunately, connecting thousands of transistors meant thousands of wires, and circuit boards were just a jumbled mess, and it was almost impossible to do. This was solved with the invention of the integrated circuit. Soon, many transistors could just be printed onto circuit boards. You would think that this invention would open the floodgates for innovation, awe, and wonder. But no, once again there was acceptance lag and nobody used the invention. This all quickly changed when the Russians were the first to enter space. This pushed President Kennedy to make affirmative action. NASA needed to get an American crew of astronauts into space. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. But that wasn't possible with a one-ton computer. NASA soon stumbled across the integrated circuit and they began to utilise it. Looking back on it today, that was a real turning point. It was the real start of the modern age of computing. 
we managed to send man into space, to the moon, and return him safely back to Earth. It was a real triumph for the whole of humanity, and it wouldn't have been possible without the integrated circuit. But just for a comparison, today's high-end smartphones are over 2,200 times faster, with over 3 million times the memory, of the NASA Apollo 11 guidance computer. The first integrated circuit had 10 transistors and cost $10,000. Over time, things obviously changed, and it was the fastest change in history to be exact. Today, our chips have billions of transistors. That's why we have so much power. So, we're about to move into the 1970s. But before we do, let's take a look at two revolutionary ideas that should have changed the world as we know it, but didn't because the level of acceptance lag was just too damn high. The first one was Sketchpad, a revolutionary drawing program that was invented in 1960. The point to note here was that it was the software that was the breakthrough. The hardware was still that big old clunky computer that people thought was for number crunching only. Written and the amazing thing to me is that this, this did not start a vast movement. In fact, it just stood there as an example that people would gaze at. They'd look at the movie and say, yeah, gee, well, that's very inspirational. And then they'd go back and do exactly what they were doing. Probably the most baffling area of this story was Douglas Engelbert. He was by far the biggest visionary of the computer industry. Not Steve Jobs, Douglas Engelbert. The acceptance lag level was over 9,000. In a spectacular 1968 demo, he showed us the invention of the mouse, hyperlink text, the precursor to email, and the very beginnings of the graphical user interface, the same technology that we love and use every single day. Journals, and they'd say, well, I tried a mouse, and it was too hard to use. It, it never worked. It's kind of trying to awake people to the potential of which this is just scratching the surface of what's really there to help people think and work together. Sadly, Douglas Engelbert passed away just before the recording of this program. I'm sure that he'll be happy that billions of people use his inventions every day. As we move into the 1970s, the pace of change absolutely explodes. The culprit? The 1971 invention of the microprocessor by a little company called Intel. Now, for the first time, thousands of transistors can be on a single chip. It set a chain of events in motion that we're still seeing the effects of today. Just how fast were the changes happening? Let's find out. He is, if the auto industry had moved at the same speed as our industry, uh, your car today would uh, cruise comfortably at a million miles an hour, probably get a half a million miles per gallon of gasoline. But it would be cheaper to throw away your, your Rolls Royce and buy a new one than to park it downtown for the evening. The microchip caused an explosion in the industry, and most companies amalgamated around the San Francisco Bay Area. It was later to be dubbed Silicon Valley. A printer company named Xerox built off the platform of Engelbert's work. They built the personal computer as we know it today, in 1973, over 10 years before anyone else. But they couldn't see a reason why anyone would want one, so they didn't market it. Yep, they had the future and they just let it sit there. But we'll come back to this. Xerox had the mindset of most companies at the time. One of such companies was IBM. They were very happy using massive mainframe computers but for the life of them, they could not understand why people would want a personal computer. But as it turns out, people did want a personal computer. People just dreamed of what they could do if they had all of this power to themselves. Here we meet one of three major influential characters in this story. Steve Wozniak. Back then, the mini computer with 4K of RAM cost as much as a house. I told my father I've decided that someday I'm going to have an apartment instead of a house, and I'm going to buy myself a computer. I'm going to be the one person that owns a computer. Steve Wozniak was friends with our second character, Steve Jobs, since the age of 14. They were always known to build little technical projects together, so building a computer with a newfound microchip wasn't that big of a leap. Steve Wozniak wanted his own computer so badly, he built one for himself. And that was it. He just wanted it for himself. 
But Steve Jobs saw the potential. He saw that everyone could have something like this, and everyone would want it. He saw what IBM and Xerox couldn't see. He saw a product. Contrary to popular belief, neither of them knew how to run a business. They probably would have ended up flat on their faces and collapsing like all the other startup companies in the day. They needed someone to guide them. They turned to Mike Markelow. And the two guys really didn't have the background and experience to, to start a company and, and make it successful. So I agreed to help them. Soon after the collaboration with Mike, the Apple II was released. Remember, nobody really knew what to use the personal computer for. Most of the public didn't even know what a personal computer was. The Apple II needed some software that would win the masses. VisiCalc. It was the first electronic spreadsheet. Just think about it. Before this, if you were in business, you would have to sit there for hours doing numerous calculations by hand, and you weren't allowed to make a mistake. It blew people's minds. I remember showing it to one around here, and he started shaking and said, that's what I do all week. I could do it in an hour. I could do, you know, you know, and they would take their credit cards and shove them in your face. And sales took off. Apple became the fastest growing company in history. So what had once taken up an entire room, cost millions of dollars and weighed a ton, was now flying off the shelves in droves. IBM took notice and they eventually made their own version of the PC. IBM went on to dominate the market and it was our third character that helped them do that. His name was Bill Gates. Let's move on to the 80s. This is where the story really reaches its climax and a huge battle for market supremacy emerges. Ah, the 1980s. In the 1980s, flaunting wealth, power and technology was the in thing to do. So personal computers that gave business users the advantage and the edge just went crazy. In the early 1980s, PC hardware was still extremely primitive by today's standards. This is a hard drive from around that period, just take a look at it. It weighed about 250 kilograms and cost tens of thousands of dollars. Well, it probably stored all of the world's information, right? Nope, it stored 250 megabytes. That's about 19 times less than a DVD, or about a third of a CD. And obviously there was no way this was going to fit in a PC. This is a 32 gigabyte micro SD card from today. It holds about 128 times the data, weighs a quarter of a gram, and costs about 30 to 40 bucks. In addition to the pitiful hardware, the software was pretty bad too. And guess who wrote it? Bill Gates. In a funny twist, it turns out that Bill Gates' mother actually knew the chairman of IBM. Through this, IBM contracted Bill Gates to write the software for their new PC. Instead of actually writing the software, Bill Gates bought the code he required from another company for $50,000. And then he modified it. Now that the software was his, he sold it back to IBM and kept the rights to his product. This product was Microsoft DOS. The early 80s was a turbulent time and the gold rush period for the PC market. Since there were so many PC manufacturers appearing, Bill Gates just noticed that he could just sell his software to everyone and his profits went off the charts. On the other side of the fence, a few years earlier, in 1979, Steve Jobs had been invited to see the Xerox graphical computer. You know, the company that built off the work of Douglas Engelbert. I thought it was the best thing I had ever seen in my life. Now, within, you know, 10 minutes, it was obvious to me that all computers would work like this someday. I just had no clue about uh, a computer or what it could do. And so they, they just grabbed, uh, grabbed defeat from the greatest victory in the computer industry. Xerox could have owned the entire computer industry today. The Xerox computer inspired Steve Jobs to make the very first Macintosh. Steve Jobs eventually asked Gates to write the software for the Macintosh. In a move of pure blindness, Steve Jobs had just given Bill Gates full access to the unlicensed software for the Mac. Huge mistake. Bill Gates would later on betray Steve Jobs by copying the look and feel of the Macintosh.
Unfortunately, Macintosh sales weren't doing that great, but Steve Jobs was still in his own illusion bubble, thinking that the Macintosh would be a hot seller. Apple didn't agree, and in a sad twist, he was fired by his own company. John Scully broke the news. And uh, he destroyed everything I'd spent 10 years working for. Um, starting with me, but that wasn't the saddest part. Uh, I would have gladly left Apple if Apple would have turned out like I'd wanted it to. In Jobs' own mind, the Macintosh would change the world. It did, but not directly. After the loss of Steve Jobs, Bill Gates began to steal more and more from what he'd seen in the Macintosh. He was putting it into a new operating system. It would be called Windows. And now the war was between Microsoft PCs and the Macintosh. A massive lawsuit erupted and things turned thermonuclear. Microsoft simply overpowered Apple and won the court case. In 1990, with the launch of Windows 3.0, all hope was lost. Windows 3.0 went on to sell 3 million copies in the first year, and the Mac instantly became a niche product. Um, and so I, I guess I am saddened, not by Microsoft's success. I have no problem with their success. They've earned their success, for the most part. I have a problem with the fact that they just make really third-rate products. We all know how the story went. It's pretty sad. Apple slowly started dying and became the laughing stock and the bottom rung throughout the 90s. This probably explains why Steve was so secretive and so strict over his products in his later life. Eventually, the Mac was just forgotten and it was Windows that took centre stage. This was true until something, a small, white and silver rectangular box, came along and changed the fate of Apple. And with that, we've reached the end of part one of the series. I'm going to have to leave you guys here. But before I depart, I want to talk a little bit about something. In 1973, an event occurred that will shape our lives today and even more so in the future. It was, of course, the invention of the mobile phone by Martin Cooper. I wonder what Martin's inspiration was. It was actually Star Trek. So come back to hear that story and a lot more. There's a lot coming up on the Death of the PC Part 2, only on Cold Fusion TV. Next time we go through the 90s, 2000s, 2010s, we see the rise of the internet age, Apple's comeback and apparent decline, the rise of Samsung, and of course, the future. You haven't seen anything yet. If you want to see older episodes of Cold Fusion TV, just check out the playlist below in the description. As a side point, this is a whole lot of work. This is the hardest I've ever worked on a video. I think it's because I'm trying to prove something to the world. Technology doesn't have to be boring or lame. I just really want to show that to the world. I'm just trying to educate people differently. It's always just been something I've wanted to do. So if you guys could help out by sharing it over Facebook, Twitter, to your grandma, it doesn't really matter. That would just be a great help. You guys are amazing. And thanks a lot for watching through to the very end. I know the modern attention span isn't that long, so you guys have done well. As usual, don't forget to rate, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you in the future. Peace.